From the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland, welcome to NASA's New Horizons Countdown to Pluto. I'm Mike Buckley from APL Communications and Public Affairs with the update from Pluto's doorstep as we count down to New Horizons' historic flyby of the Pluto system on July 14th. We're 21 days away from the Pluto flyby, just under 16 million miles from Pluto, and activity across the team is picking up. Let's get the latest on that activity with an operations update. And with us is Gabe Rogers, the New Horizons spacecraft systems engineer and guidance and control lead. Gabe, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Mike. Now, you work on the guidance and control system, which, uh, you know, the name implies that this would be a critical system on anything that flies. But uh, tell us a little bit how important it is for a spacecraft that's flying so far from home and has so much to do. Well, guidance control is very important. Uh, if we are not pointed accurately, then we won't be able to collect the uh, science images. We won't be able to uh, conduct the trajectory correction maneuvers. And we wouldn't be able to point back to the Earth to downlink the telemetry. So we have very fine pointing requirements on New Horizons. And it all is, has to be pre-programmed so that we get the best images for the scientists. Yeah, pre-programmed because I mean, New Horizons is counted on to do a lot of it uh, on its own because it's flying so far. We get the commands up and rely on the spacecraft to do what we tell it to do. Absolutely. We design all of these things and upload two-week two sequences way in advance. And then it's up to the spacecraft to know, basically know where it is in order to point to the planet correctly and take the best images. You mentioned trajectory corrections. On June 14th, right, the team marked out the P minus 30 days mark uh, by conducting a, a, a TCM, yes. right, as we call them. So tell us why those, they're so important. Well, we need to be arriving at Pluto at the right time and at the right location in order to maintain the geometry that we designed for all of the science observations. It's also very important to get there at the proper time in order to conduct the Pluto and Sherrod occultations, where we actually find, fly behind the planet and the sun then sort of goes out and the scientists are able to collect observations that'll tell them the composition of the atmosphere. If you don't get there at the proper time, um, you're not going to be able to do those, those observations. And so we very subtly have to adjust the, the trajectory of, of the spacecraft in order to make sure we get there at just the right time. Okay. Uh, what did this latest one do specifically? Well, the, we were coming in a little bit early. So this last one slowed us down by about 80 seconds, and it changed the, uh, the arrival point by a few hundred kilometers. We, we have pretty tight requirements in a 100 kilometer by 150 kilometer box, and we were outside that box. Following this maneuver, we're back inside that box. Okay. Well, um, why don't we take a look at the activity inside mission operations on June 14th? Attention on the mock as you uh, so get enough telemetry to report status, please do so. Over no, no. Um, um, this is GNC on Pluto 1. Um, yes, do you have status check? Uh, yes, the burn was nominal. GNC is ringing. Copy that. Sandy H. Mom on Pluto 1. Mom on Sandy H. Pluto 1. Special is the screen. Navigation, Mom on Pluto 1. Navigation is green. Doppler residual looks consistent with the uh, precast uh, last night, uh, given the burn reader, so the burn looks nominal. Copy that. Thank you. Pop, Mom on Twitter 1. Propulsion is green. Mom on Twitter 1. Navigation, Mom on Twitter 1. Autonomy. Autonomy is green. Rule 312 is disabled. MSC, Mom on Twitter 1. Mom, this is MSC on Twitter 1. All systems are So this morning's uh, course correction was to make sure that we hit that aim point of 7,800 miles. And so this was, if we do the, the course correction early, we can use less propellant than if we wait and do it a little bit later. Um, burn was nominal, it went perfect. Yeah, we're ecstatic because uh, we needed this burn to get right back down on the center line so that we can do a hole in one at Pluto and it worked perfectly. We have three more opportunities to do another burn to try and tweak up the orbit. Um, we're hoping we don't have to do any, but it's, there's a high likelihood that we will have to do at least one more. So what activity is next for uh, spacecraft operations and for the team? So the next few weeks we are still collecting optical navigation images to verify that we are on the correct path. Mm 
-hmm. to Pluto. We're also collecting increasing science observations, and we're starting to execute the Phase A loads. Those are the loads that we developed years ago and put on a shelf, essentially, and now we're, for the first time, actually executing them on the spacecraft. So it is, it's an exciting time. All those years, right, and the planning to get those on, now you're seeing them work yes. on the spacecraft, too. Uh, speaking of the spacecraft, everything's healthy? Everything looks good on board? Everything's healthy. All the hardware right now is operating nominally, and the spacecraft is performing the sequences that we have gave it. So the, the images look wonderful, and and we're excited to see what's next. Well, thanks, Gabe. Thanks, Mark. And now for a science update. Project scientist Hal Weaver is here to fill us in on New Horizons science. Hal, thanks for joining us. Hi, Mike. Glad to be back. Um, the, uh, one of the bigger announcements over the past week was another all clear for New Horizons and the hazard search. Can you fill us in on that? Yeah, that's one of the most important things we're doing right now during the approach to Pluto. Uh, in fact, this is by far the deepest we've looked for new satellites and potential dust in the system that could, uh, you know, that, that were, you know, could potentially pose a hazard to the spacecraft. And so we took 384 images, each of them 10 seconds long, so over an hour straight staring at the Pluto system trying to pick out new satellites and, and little dust particles. And again, still saw the saw Pluto, Charon, the four other moons, yes. but still nothing smaller inside that. Yeah, the thing that was so hard for Hubble to see, the sticks, the smallest satellite, is now a piece of cake for Lori on New Horizons. So we easily see that. We can go well below the brightness of sticks. And we're not, still not seeing anything, which is great, you know, uh, from the perspective of uh, danger to the spacecraft. Uh, with the, the LORI camera, the Long Range Reconnaissance Imager, the tool that we're looking to look into the system at this point, it seems that the views of the Pluto system, you know, especially from that camera, are quickly getting better and better. Uh, tell us about the improvement that we've seen over even the past week. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, like you say, it's getting better and better. Just the cool thing is we're 20 days out. Pluto is now 20 pixels across in LORI. <laughs> you know, it's dramatically improved. We're starting to see more and more surface features on the, on the planet. And... Uh, you know, another 10 days and it'll be another twice as big as that. And then, you know, roughly three days out, it gets to be 100 pixels across and then 1,000 pixels across. Yeah, and it's going to come quickly. I mean, we're oh, just going to yeah. see it bigger and bigger and bigger as we go and then it's passed. That's right, exactly. Uh, we just ramp up the coverage, you know, take more and more images. Uh, we want to get as, as detailed a view of Pluto's surface and Charon's surface and the best looks possible for all of the other uh, moons in the system. And, uh, you know, we're going to cram as much as we can. I point out, too, that people are able to check the pictures that Lori is taking on the New Horizons website. I mean, there's the raw image page where within 48 hours of those pictures being received on the ground, they're up on the website for people to check out. Oh, yeah. We think it's very important to share with the public. Uh, let them share in the excitement. It's Pluto. They can watch it themselves getting bigger and bigger. Um, and more, you know, you can see more and more surface features uh, by looking, going to the LORI website. Uh, we actually try to get it up even within 48 hours as, as you know, when it lands on the ground. So uh, a lot of people seem to be having fun with those images and we're happy to, to have them share. Okay, so what, uh, what's coming up then over the next week or so for the, the science team and science observation? Yeah, just ramping up the coverage, more and more observations, getting better and better resolution. Uh, we have a couple of, you know, more very important uh, deep searches with LORI, uh, you know, trying to, to even go even farther uh, to look for, for satellites, new satellites and dust, just to make sure the coast is clear. And so far, everything is looking great. Thanks, Hal. And we've heard from lots of people who can't wait to see Pluto up close. You can only imagine the excitement among the mission scientists and engineers who've invested so much time and energy to reach this distant world. But why do they love Pluto? Let's meet a real Plutophile. Bill McKinnon, I uh, work at Washington University in St. Louis, and I'm interested in pretty much everything about Pluto, but really the, its geology and geophysics, and especially its origin and where it came from and how it evolved. When I began to work on Pluto, literally the number of people who were thinking about Pluto, you could count on the fi you know, fingers of your hands, and it was a, sort of a, a fun little hobby, okay, to be sort of a Plutophile in those days. We have a 
fantastic new vision of the solar system. That it went through a violent phase of instability and the giant planets uh, were much more closer together in the beginning and then they spread out and they scattered small bodies everywhere but especially bodies into what we call the Kuiper Belt and Pluto is at the moment still the king of the Kuiper Belt in terms of linear dimension the largest body there but even though it's out there at nearly 40 astronomical units and travels in a big arc of an orbit farther and closer to the Sun over hundreds of years it actually was born much closer to the Sun. If Pluto formed close to the Sun, that means it probably formed pretty fast. And when you form fast, you get hot, and therefore melted its ice and the rock settled into the center, and now you have a great setup. You have a, basically a rock core, an ice shell over, over that, and then in between, sandwiched in between, would be an ocean of liquid water with all sorts of interesting dissolved chemicals. And the best way we can tell that is probably to just study the geology and the composition of the surface in detail, which is exactly what we're going to do. And we, if it's pretty round, we'll be much more comfortable with it being an active body and maybe even having an ocean today, which would be very exciting. I think we will see craters. I think we will see the remnants of icy volcanic structures, and I know that sounds bizarre, and some we even call it, have a bizarre name for it, we call it cryovolcanism, cold volcanism, that we're talking about erupted ammonia, or erupted methane, or even erupted liquid nitrogen. These are the kinds of things that could go on on the surface of, of Pluto. Anybody who thinks that when we go to Pluto and we're gonna find cold, dead ice balls is in for, in for a rude shock, <laughs> but I'm really hoping to see a very active and dynamic world. Uh, I'm Bill McKinnon and I'm a Plutophile because Pluto is the last unexplored outpost of the solar system. The furthest, the farthest, the least known. Now the mission has a great tool at its disposal to get all that science data and that's the New Horizons spacecraft. But you have to get it to the right place at the right time and tell it what to do. So we brought Mission Encounter Manager Mark Holdridge back to help explain how that happens. So Mark, thanks for coming back. You're welcome. Um, I guess first let's start with even just the overall goals of the New Horizons mission and what science it wants to achieve in the Pluto system. I mean, you get one shot at this. What are we looking for? Well, the scientists have dozens and dozens of observations they want to take of the Pluto system, Pluto, Charon, and the other moons of Pluto, and they prioritize those in level one, level two, and level three requirements so that we can perform various trades on which ones we can do or others that maybe we can't. And then we, we expect that the, the bulk of the requirements will be satisfied during closest approach, the level one requirements. They require really the highest resolution observations. And there's a whole list. I mean, there are ideas of just not getting some, but there's a long list of things the team wants right, to get. Right, hundreds and hundreds of observations. Okay, the, with those observations then, tell us how you design then a flyby that gets all that information. How do you work that with the spacecraft? So we, we really have like two competing activities. One is delivering the spacecraft to the target uh, in the prescribed box, the window that we're trying to hit, the 90 by 60 mile box, uh, within the prescribed time. So that's really a navigation challenge. And then we have the science observations themselves. So we have to stitch a timeline together that um, accommodates both of those types of requirements so that we can both deliver the spacecraft and perform the various observations that we're looking to do. You have to design sequences then that are loaded onto the spacecraft well ahead of time, right? That actually, and they're timed to execute and do different things. Right, so we actually have developed the sequence for uh, the seven days leading up to closest approach. We started that years ago and have uh, performed a number of different iterations with it and tested and tested the heck out of it. Um, but that's actually loaded up about nine days out from closest approach. And starting at seven days out, that sequence starts, and the spacecraft is pretty much uh, running on autopilot for the most part. It's executing these commands at, at very rigid, absolute times um, as, as we've built into the command sequences. Now, how intricate a dance are those command sequences? What does the spacecraft have to do, or how do you have to make sure it moves between so many sequences without skipping a beat. Right, so as you can see from the uh, picture behind me, the spacecraft's rigid, so everything has to be uh, pointed one thing at a time. So if we're doing a science observation, we can do uh, pointing for one observation, then we slew the spacecraft a little bit and point to the next uh, object that we want to look at. And then we'll point back to Earth, for instance, to play data back or send additional commands up. So it's, it's really a time choreographing of the pointing of the spacecraft um, it's required to carry all this out. And also too, I mean, even these are all happening within seconds. 
It's going observation from observation. Right. We have a very dense set of observations because uh, we want to make the best use of the time during the closest approach, during that day plus and minus a day or so from closest approach to get the very best data that we can. And so the spacecraft at that point pretty much is point Pluto pointing, as you, as you might expect. Uh, we're not doing a, a whole lot of communications with the spacecraft directly other than the occultations that we have when we fly by the shadows of Pluto. So it's not just as simple as pointing. There's a whole element of timing and precision uh, to make sure that you get the observations that are programmed and they're in the right place. So um, let's take a look at how that works. After a journey of over three billion miles and nine years in flight, NASA's New Horizons spacecraft flies by Pluto and its moons on July 14th, 2015. I'm Mark Holdridge, New Horizons Encounter Mission Manager. Doing successful science at Pluto depends on pinpoint accuracy in targeting New Horizons cameras. While traveling at a speed of 36,000 miles per hour, 14 kilometers a second. One of our challenges is that Pluto was only discovered in 1930, and its journey around the sun is 248 years, so we've only been following it for about one-third of its orbit. It's hard to know its precise position. So we're actually using the New Horizons long-range camera, LORI, to more accurately refine where Pluto is. Starting on January 25th, we're taking pictures using LORI, New Horizons' longest-range imager, which we use both for navigation and for science. Of course, we'll get more and more precise results as we get closer to Pluto, getting ready for a truly close approach and flyby on July 14th, 2015. That's when we really need precise pointing, when we're whizzing by the planet and its moons. So here I am, like a tourist, visiting Washington, D.C., driving down the mall and trying to take a clear shot of the Washington Monument. Of course, to get the clearest picture, I have to move the camera, taking into account the speed of the car I'm riding in and knowing exactly when to click the shutter. And for a large object like the Washington Monument, I have to take several images to get the whole monument in the field of view. That's just what we'll be doing with our long-range camera, which has a narrow field of view, taking lots of individual shots to make up a mosaic or composite image. So for New Horizons, it's much more complicated than being a tourist. And since I'm not driving, why don't we try a little thought experiment? I'm gonna put on a blindfold and then try to take a picture of the monument. At Pluto, New Horizons is more than four and a half light hours from Earth, so there's no way Mission Control can do any kind of real-time adjustment. All our commands have been sent up in advance. All our instruments are completely pre-sequenced. We've been at this for many years, planning and refining and replanning. Our encounter sequence has some 25,000 lines of code, and we don't want to make any last-minute changes that might create problems. But what we can do is change the time when we start the sequence based on updated navigation data as we get close. But in order to know where and when to start taking pictures, we have to know Pluto's exact location. And this is where LORI is once again our spyglass or optical navigation tool. So we do have to figure out exactly how far we are from Pluto. And we do that using the parallax effect. Sound complicated? Well, it is rocket science, but let's see how it works. See that traffic light? As we get closer, it seems to rise higher in the sky relative to the background objects. Simple geometry permits us to estimate our absolute distance to the object by measuring how much the background is shifting. For Pluto, as we approach, we use LORI to see how fast it's appearing to change position against the fixed background stars. It's only gonna be in the final days we're gonna get the best shots of Pluto and at vital navigation data needed. It's gonna be awesome. But combining rocket science and lots of practice, we have a very good shot at getting some great shots of Pluto and its moons. Stay tuned and follow us online. You look a little warmer now than when you uh, originally shot that piece, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That, that was a good explanation of exactly how we get some of that data and the challenges of that, but it's not over after that because now we have to get all that information back to Earth. Right. Uh, take us to the timeline and then some of the challenge of sending that because it's not something that happens overnight, is it? Right. So everybody's going to be very excited to see the data as it comes off the spacecraft as soon as possible. Uh, we'll initially be playing back a browse data set to get lower resolution data and a quick look at, at the imagery that we took and the other science data that we took during the flyby. But um, the actual data rates are between one and two kilobits a second. 
So they're fairly slow data rates. So the data is going to come off at a very gradual rate over the course of a roughly 16 months before we get it all back. And it's different types, so you're able to see, I mean, you're getting a, a first look uh, by the, about the end of the year, and then after that, uh, through 2016, the, the higher resolution material. You get to see the, really get to see inside the material. Right, so initially the data, the quick look data or the browse data is, is compressed, and then what we do is we play back the raw data, the uncompressed data, to get the true sort of undoctored science data in its purest form, and that takes a lot longer to play back. That's really why it takes 16 months. Yeah. And, and discoveries, too. I mean, we'll have discoveries later in, the, in 2015. We'll have discoveries in 2016 throughout, so right. there's something to look forward to. Right, so it's kind of like during the approach phase where data's gradually kind of trickling in as Pluto's getting bigger and bigger. After the flyby, it'll be much the same way. The, tr the scientists will keep discovering new things for months and months afterwards. Um, all right, well, Mark, again, thanks for coming back to explain all this. My pleasure, very exciting times ahead, Mike. NASA is exploring the solar system and beyond, and with its three billion mile voyage, New Horizons is way out there. Just how far is that? Let's watch as NASA Planetary Science Division Director Jim Green takes us on the path to Pluto. Hi, I'm Jim Green. I'm the Director of Planetary Science at NASA. And we're here just outside the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. to take the Planetary Science Walk. And I hope at the end of this, you'll get an appreciation for how far Pluto really is away from the Earth. Here we are at the Sun, the center of our solar system. Of course, life on Earth can't exist without the Sun. As you can see, the terrestrial planets are maybe 40 feet away from the Sun. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Of course, the Earth is the most studied planet of our solar system. Our satellites are performing all kinds of observations that give us weather, that give us the uh, information that we need on our daily lives to live here on Earth. It's our pale blue dot. Beyond Earth, Mars is the most studied planet of our solar system. We've had 42 missions to Mars. Only 16 of them actually have either flown by, orbited, or landed on Mars. Mars was really quite different than it is today in its past. We believe it had clouds, rivers, lakes, oceans, but climate change occurred, and it's now a much more arid planet. Okay, we're on our way to Jupiter, but we have to pass through an area where the asteroids live. They're actually a planet that was trying to come together, but Jupiter's gravity has kept them apart. Right now, we have a mission called Dawn that's now getting into orbit around Ceres, the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. Here's where the asteroids would be in this particular area. And we're now heading to Jupiter, but Jupiter is five times further from the sun than the Earth is. Here we are at Jupiter, our largest planet. We've had several flybys of Jupiter, starting with the Pioneer 10 and 11, then Voyager 1 and 2. We've studied many of the moons, some of the fabulous moons of Jupiter like Ganymede, Callisto, Europa, and Io. Here we are at the beautiful ring planet Saturn. Saturn's been studied now for many years. We've had flybys by the Voyagers, but now we have Cassini. Cassini's in orbit, has been in orbit for about 10 years now, and is making fabulous observations of the planet, its rings, and its many moons. It's much bigger than the next two planets, Uranus and Neptune, but that's an even bigger hike. Well, here we are now at the other end of a very long block, and we're only at the planet Uranus. Uranus has been visited by the Voyagers. It's what we call an ice giant. It's made up of a lot of ices like ammonia, but Uranus is much like Neptune, and Neptune is an even greater hike down this next block. Wow, what a walk. Neptune's been visited by only one spacecraft, Voyager 2, and it found an array of new moons, fabulous magnetic field. One of the moons, Triton, 
orbits the planet in the opposite direction that our moon orbits the Earth. It's called retrograde. We believe Triton may be a Pluto-like object. We'll only find out when we get to Pluto. And that's our last stop. It's almost another half a block from Neptune. It's so far away. Now, even though this took us tens of minutes to actually make this walk, the New Horizons spacecraft was launched over nine years ago, and it's getting now very close to Pluto. Finally, here we are at Pluto. This flyby is gonna be absolutely spectacular. We're gonna be able to see this body as we've never seen it before, really up close and personal. You know, Pluto is an object of wonder ever since it was discovered in 1930. We now know that Pluto has five moons. As we get closer to it, we may even find more moons. It may even have rings. We know that Pluto has an atmosphere, but Pluto is really one of hundreds, perhaps thousands of objects we call Kuiper Belt objects. What we'll learn from Pluto will tell us about that initial event that brought the solar system together. It's the last major body in our solar system that we really need to visit. It's the end of a basic reconnaissance of our solar system. You know, I'd like to think in the future that we'll find so many fascinating things out about Pluto, we'll want to go back. So today we're only a few months away from the encounter. We're less than an astronomical unit, the distance between the Earth and the Sun, that distance away from this fascinating object. Please come online and follow the excitement as we get closer and closer to Pluto. We'll unveil it, we'll see what it's like. Pluto, we're on our way. Now that's extreme exploration. And that's also the latest from NASA's New Horizons mission on Pluto's doorstep. 21 days and 16 million miles to go until the flyby, the countdown to Pluto continues. I'm Mike Buckley from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, and we'll see you next week.